Hello, everyone. Welcome to Personal Archiving, the basics of saving your family papers. I'm Heather Register Zabendon, the programs and website coordinator for the Roberts Library, part of the Central Arkansas Library System. You can email us questions about this presentation, the Memory Lab, or specific questions about your family papers and how to preserve them at arcinfo at cals.org. There's no handout for this class, um, but I will reference pages on our website where you can get more information. The Central Arkansas Library System is part of a national memory lab network started by the DC Public Library with funding from the Institute for Museum and Library Services. The DIY Memory Lab is located on the third floor of Roberts Library in downtown Little Rock. It's open Tuesday through Friday, 1015 a.m. to 430 p.m. The Memory Lab has two stations, one for scanning photos, negatives, and slides, and one for digitizing VHS or beta home movies, as well as audio cassettes. The Memory Lab is do-it-yourself from start to finish, from making the appointment to the actual digitization process. You'll make appointments by going online at robertslibrary.org slash memory lab. Appointments are two hours long and you can make back-to-back -back appointments. The first 30 minutes of your first appointment on each station will be a brief orientation on how to use the equipment. Saturday appointments are available by emailing us at memorylab at cows.org. Here's what I'm going to cover today. This program should take about an hour. Here's a disclaimer. Although I'm a public historian and have training in archival processes and preservation, the practices I'll go over in this class are not necessarily best practices. Think of these as goodish practices that get the job done. So why is personal archiving important? For historians, the personal papers of everyday people are the great discoveries of the work we do. I would argue that personal archiving, the personal papers of everyday people, are more important and more significant to the study of human history than the papers of the great, famous, or the infamous. Plus, there's more of us than there are of them, and the details of our, of our lives are going to tell a more accurate story of how we lived. The papers, photographs, and letters you've got stored in your basements, attics, and closets can show us how things used to be done and how things in our world have changed. My personal archive consists of a lot of family parts. Because I am the public historian in the family, I got all the stuff. I have both my mother's and my father's side of the family. That includes my grandparents, my grandparents' siblings, in the case of my maternal grandfather, that's going to be 13 people. My grandparents' parents, so my great-grandparents, dozens of cousins, and an assortment of by-marriage extended family members. As you're organizing your stuff and getting it ready to digitize, you want to think of how you want to organize both your physical originals and your digital copies. There are three ways I've seen people organize their stuff. Chronological, by family group, or by person, place, event. Depending on who is doing the organizing and digitizing can affect what system you use. For me, family group was the best choice because I didn't know all the people in the photos and didn't have a good chronological order. But if your collection is something you created in your lifetime, so it's you, your children, your grandchildren, then you might want to go with the chronological. Before you start going through your things, you need to determine how you are going to store your originals. What types of containers you'll need. And don't think that you have to go out and buy all this stuff at once. The whole idea of personal archiving is to digitize everything and then store the originals so you don't have to handle them ever again, or at least not very often. There is a supply list and a vendor list available on our website at robertslibrary.org slash memory lab. 
You want to get multiple barriers between your archival item and the outside environment. The goal here is to put distance between the elements, so dirt, dust, water, air, and the archival thing. So think of it as photo or document, then acid-free archival housing like a folder or a mylar sleeve, then an acid-free archival box stored in your house or apartment, and finally the outside world. Here's another disclaimer. Be aware of big box stores and craft supply stores. In particular, their scrapbooking supplies. Oftentimes these things are marked arch archival or acid free, but they're not the same quality as what we use in an archive. So the gold standard for archival storage is the Hollinger box. It's a brand name that's become generic. I recommend that you get the legal size of this as well as some legal size acid free file folders. Acid-free isn't acid-free forever, but it should remain acid-free for our lifetimes and that of our children. Locally here in Arkansas, at the Container Store, you can purchase archival boxes and some acid-free tissue paper. There are also online vendors like Gaylord, University Products, and other archival supply vendors. Again, there's a supply and vendor list on our website at robertslibrary.org slash memory lab. I am a huge fan of these photo storage boxes from University Products, but you can find them at other vendors. These are per the perfect size for most photographs and take up less space in a closet than a tall Hollinger box. I'm also a big fan of these archival flap envelopes. You can get those as well as archival microfiche sleeves um, that work really nicely for photos. Also for my collection, I had more photos than I had paper documents, so these worked out really nicely. And again, the supply list and vendor list is available, available on our website at robertslibrary.org slash memory lab. If you need access to your personal archiving files, such as land deeds or title papers, and a digital copy just won't do, you might want to invest in a fire safe file box or file cabinet. These can be pricey, but they might be worth they might be worth it if you have a lot of papers that you need to access on a regular basis. You'll still need to get archival quality hanging file folders and acid free regular file folders, but these will work if you need to get your hands on your documents. So where to store it once it's digitized and rehoused? Where to store your originals? You don't want to store your personal archive in a basement, even if it's a finished basement. You don't want to store it in a garage, attic, or barn. Climate-controlled off-site storage might be good if you don't have a space in the main part of your house or apartment to, to accommodate the items. So now you're going to get all of your stuff out of its hiding places and start organizing. The Library of Congress actually calls this process clumping. Here are a couple of important tips. If you're dealing with papers from different sides of a family, and they are already separated by family or individual, keep them that way. Work with one family group or individual group at a time. Future generations will thank you. So survey your whole collection. Find a temporary workspace in the main part of your house away from pets and kids. Here are a few examples of what my boxes looked like at the, be at the beginning. As you can see, I've got lots of photos mixed in with papers. I've got newspaper clippings and film negatives in the same box. And there's even a woman's lace clutch in one box. You don't need to wear white gloves to do this kind of work. Just clean, dry, unlotioned hands. Gloves can actually damage fragile papers but you do want to be careful when you're holding your photographs. You want to hold them on the edges um, and try not to touch the fronts. You may encounter mold, mildew, or other unmentionables such as bugs while you're going through things. Um, so you might want to have some gallon Ziploc bags handy to quarantine these items so you can deal with them later. Assess what different types of things you have. Think about these categories, letters, documents, photos, and random things. 
Again, if you're dealing with one, more than one family group, I recommend working with one group at a time. Better yet, at first, one container from one group at a time. So where to work? You want a clean, clutter-free area. You want a flat surface. For most of us, that's gonna be a kitchen or dining table. I've seen someone use a ping pong table before, which I think is great. Wipe or dust the surface before starting. No pledge or furniture, or furniture polish. If you use a damp cloth, allow the surface to dry or dry it before you start work. If you have a coworker, like a cat, you might wanna segregate them to another part of the house. They will not be helpful. At this point, you're just clumping like things together. Group all the photographs from one box together. If they have stickers or writing on them already, don't remove the stickers or try to get rid of the writing, but don't add stickers or writing either. If they're in paper frame sleeves, leave them together for now. If you have tin types or daguerreotypes, don't remove them from their casings. You will ruin them. Get letters, newspaper clippings, papers, and other documents into light groups. Keep envelopes with their letters, please. Don't staple things, but don't remove staples at this point. You might want to use plastic paper clips if you're really worried that something might get separated, but this is only a temporary solution. So here's that same box after my first round of clumping. Think of this as your first pass at organizing. You're gonna organize further right before you start digitizing. As you're clumping and organizing your collection, you will come across things like tape, staples, paper clips, and other issues. Here's what you might find, and here's how you might deal with it. Tape is evil, plain and simple. The number it can do on paper is incredible. You can lose important information from the past. Also, metal paper clips are problematic, as well as metal staples and rubber bands. There is no such thing as archival tape or adhesive. All tape is bad, please do not use it. Okay, so let's go back to this slide. In exhibit A, you will see what type of destruction tape can do to a document. Exhibits B and C show you the damage a metal paper clip can do. Exhibit D shows how to gently remove a rusted sta staple, but you're, pre you're probably still gonna lose um, some of the paper it's going to rip. Thankfully, most of the time staples and paper clips for that matter aren't covering important information. And finally, exhibit E shows rubber bands after they have gotten sticky and bound themselves to the paper and that is just disgusting. So how do you keep things together? Mylar is the answer. What is mylar you ask? Mylar sleeves come in a variety of sizes and usually come sealed on one side or two sides, like an L or a J. They are also referred to as polyester sleeves. But be aware that not all polyester is archival polyester. So you're looking for archival polyester that passes the photoactivity test and contains no surface coatings that could react with inks, etc. These are not sheet protectors from Office Depot. Here's a good example of something that needs to be paper clipped together or put in a Mylar sleeve. Paper folded for a long time can split, so you wanna keep both halves together. Paper clipping is always a temporary solution. Mylar is a long-term solution. But if you have items that already have tape on them, please don't try to remove it. You will digitize it and then you need to make a decision. Leave it as is and let the tape finish its destruction. The other option is if it's something that's very important to you, you're going to want to hire a paper conservator. Go to culturalheritage.org to find a certified paper conservator in your area. You probably have old photos that have been labeled on the back. Don't try to erase or remove or wipe these out. But don't add new markings. These can be very helpful in identifying people in the photos, but you don't want to continue the tradition. Also, don't assume the printer markings on the back of the photos is the date the photo was taken or any time around when the photo was taken. As you can see on the left, 
This photo is marked Eastman Kodak, and it's indicated that it was printed on August 17, 1953. I don't know about you, but I rarely took a roll of film to be developed immediately upon taking the photos. And look carefully. Listen to your photos and let them tell you the story. At first glance, the number on the back might look like 1978, but the clothes aren't 1978. And I know that one girl in this picture was an adult in 1978. Actually, it says either 197B or I97B. How did I magnify it? I took a picture with my iPhone and zoomed in. But sometimes, despite your best efforts, things are gonna happen. What if there is already damage? Take reference photos and either dispose of or store these things separately. Newspapers are the most acidic of all things. You can see here in the photo on the left, the newspaper has leached onto the opposite page. In the picture on the right, the acid in the newspaper and probably the acid in the adhesive used to glue the clippings onto the paper have forced the under paper to crumble. So what do you do? Photograph or scan and throw the clippings away, unless you really want to keep them. Magnetic photo albums from the late 20th century are also problematic. How I dealt with mine was I took reference photos of the pages or I scanned the whole page using an overhead book scanner with the vellum peeled back. If the photos were loose after I took my reference photo, I would then remove them and catalog them individually. If they're still stuck in there, just leave them and wait. Eventually they should release. We get a lot of questions about family Bibles. In many families, these are a prized heirloom, but are often falling apart. Bibles are usually mass produced with the cheapest paper products available, which made them affordable to the most people in the late 19th and early 20th century. For most families, the information they want out of the Bible is really the births, marriage, and deaths, death sections at the front or in the middle. I suggest taking photos of these with your phone. Then store the Bible in an acid-free book box, slightly larger than the dimensions of the Bible. And then you'll take acid-free tissue paper and kind of gently stuff it around the Bible to fill in the space between the book and the box. Please don't purchase or use wooden Bible boxes. Now you're almost ready to start digitizing items one by one. But let's go three, through each box before you start digitizing and get everything organized a little bit further. Here's one of my boxes after the clumping was done. I further organized the photos so I can scan groups of photos as a set. This box had a lot of different types of materials in it. I usually started scanning photos because I had the most of those and they're the most fun. I also used a lot of Ziploc sandwich bags, the fold over kind, to keep my groups of photographs together. Um, I was having to set this up when I was working on it and take it down when I wasn't working on it because this is our dining table. Now that you've gone through and clumped everything a second time, it's time to scan all your items. Just like with clumping, we need to talk about how you're gonna store, name, and share your digitized archives. Again, the point of all of this work is to digitize all of your items so you don't have to handle them. You will store the originals and, and share the digital copies with friends and family. You want to store your digital files in at least two different locations to, stay to safeguard against a massive data loss. We recommend your two locations be a cloud storage such as iCloud, Google Drive, or Dropbox, and an external hard drive. Once you've uploaded all your digi digitized items, you want to check in on your files at least once a year to make sure your storage device is working and your files are accessible. Here's a tip, put an automatic re repeatable reminder on your calendar so you don't forget.
CD-ROMs, DVDs, and flash or jump drives are not long-term storage solutions for digitized files. If you have photos or other documents stored on these items currently, we highly recommend that you move them to cloud storage or an external hard drive ASAP. So I'm going to show you the digitization process and computer file folder organization system that I used. This may not work for you, or you may have to tweak it to make it work for you and your family. Whatever you do, you want to make it work for you. Here's the disclaimer. I'm talking specifically about photos and documents you are scanning from their paper originals. Born digital media, images taken by a digital camera, smartphone, etc., is a different thing and a different class. You've organized, you've clumped, now for the scanning. For this part of the process, your mantra is, this is a marathon, not a sprint. You're not going to get it done all in one day or in one weekend. Pace yourself so you get the best scans possible. To give you an idea, my personal archiving took me about eight months working off and on. And once I was organized, it took me working a few weekends a month for several months to complete the scanning part. I've got one patron who has been working on digitizing about 20 large photo albums. He came in several times a week for two hour appointments from May to October. Flatbed scanners are really the best way to scan your photos and documents. There are lots of apps for both iPhone and Android, but we recommend using a tabletop flatbed scanner to get the best results. The Memory Lab at Cal's Roberts Library is a do-it-yourself lab for patrons to use with little or no assistance. The amount of time it's going to take you to digitize your photos and documents will depend on how many items you have and the resolution that you are scanning. Here are the scanner settings we recommend for a photograph. You're going to want to scan them, even black and white photos, using the color setting. You want to scan your items as a JPEG with at least 300 DPI. 600 is better, but it creates a larger file. The scanner settings can be changed with each set of scans. So if you have smaller photos that you want to set at a higher resol resolution, you'll be able to change them. And please don't ever use the auto feeder on a scanner to scan your personal archiving materials. The beauty of our large flatbed scanner is that you can lay out a number of photos on the glass at once. The scanner will recognize the individual photos and create separate files for each. Here you can see I've been able to get five four by six prints to be scanned at once. When you have all your photos on the glass, you will click preview to, to view everything before doing the final scan. Once you do the preview scan, you can't open the scanner lid because the images will shift. Once the preview is complete, you'll be able to rotate each scan, the digital representation of each scan. When you have all the images the way you want them, then click scan to make the final pass and save them to the computer. Scans will automatically save to the Memory Lab computer's Z drive, or you can map it so the scans will save directly to your external hard drive or thumb drive. If you save them to the Z drive, you will need to transfer your scans to cloud storage before leaving. The Z drive automatically clears at the end of the day. Your scans will automatically be named memory lab scan underscore 000 and then a number dot JPEG. To make the best use of your time, we recommend scanning all of your images and then renaming them at home. Also, the Memory Lab is not intended to be used for editing photographs. You're also probably wondering why I suggested that you save your copies to a thumb drive. Thumb drives are fine for temporary storage, but you need to take your thumb drive immediately from the Memory Lab, go home, and upload them to your home computer. You will probably have things with information on both sides. This mainly pertains to documents and other non 
photograph items. I scanned both sides as JPEGs and then gave them the same name with a two at the end of the file name of the second page or the back page. The additional numbers at the end of the file name allow me to use the same file name and keep things together. Macs and PCs don't allow duplicate, duplicate file names. I have a few really cool Christmas cards from the mid 20th century. I scanned the front and then laid out the card and scanned the inside as one image and then the envelope as the third image. If there was information on the back side of the card or the envelope, I would have scanned that as well as a separate file. Again, the file name is as descriptive as possible, keeping in mind that file names have a character limit. And then I added a number at the end so all the items will stay together in a search. For photographs, I didn't scan the back of them because it would have created so many unnecessary files. If there was information on the back, I simply added it to the file name in parentheses. If you're using a PC, you will need to use underscore instead of parentheses. In the example of the two soldiers um, with cows and a cart, the information in parentheses are my thoughts on who is in the photo. The baby in the chair photo, the information in parentheses there is the printer stamp from the back of the photo. If you have a series of photos that are either labeled the same on the back or you know they are all the same set, then give them the same file name, but number them one through whatever. This series of photos are labeled Christmas 1952. So the file name is Christmas 1952, number one, two, three, four, through seven. I have dozens of these school pictures in my collections from both sides of the family, and none of them are labeled. So my file names are just details of what I see in the picture. Be obvious and be consistent. For larger items, are items that are too fragile to be scanned on the flatbed, we do have a small over, overhead book scanner. Our flatbed scanner has the ability to scan mounted slides as well as film negatives of different varieties. If you have 110 film, please let me know in advance of your appointment because we do have a slide scanner that can scan 110 film, but I'll need to make sure it's set up and ready. Currently, the AV station allows patrons to digitize audio cassettes as well as VHS and beta tapes. These, format, these formats digitize in real time. So if you have a two hour tape, it's gonna take two hours to digitize, plus the time to render the digital file and upload it to your cloud or external hard drive. This equipment is intended to digitize home movies and other personal recordings. You are not allowed to digitize copyrighted materials. Organizing your files within your storage device. I created a folder on my iCloud and called it Clarendon Ozark. With inside that folder are three folders entitled Clarendon Ozark and Unprocessed Scans. As I scanned, I mapped the scanner so that the file saved directly to the Unprocessed Scans folder on my iCloud. In the DIY Memory Lab, we will set it up so your scans go directly to an external hard drive or to the computer's Z drive, and then you can transfer them to cloud storage before leaving. In the end, I had a total of four archival storage boxes for my physical collection, two legal size Hollinger boxes and two photo boxes. Now, what if you need to go and find the original for some reason? That's where tagging is, inv is invaluable. At the beginning, I thought I'd write all the file names of the photographs on the photo envelope, but my hand got really tired. As you can see in the photo on the left here, I only really made it to number 18 before giving up. So I implemented a tagging system that could help me locate where an item was in my boxes. In the photo on the right, the number 1.25 tells me that the envelope is in box one, folder or, in, or envelope 25. 
to differentiate between my photo boxes and my Hollinger boxes for documents, I tagged Hollinger boxes as H1 and H2. So how do you tag the digital copy? On a Mac, seen here in the dark mode windows, right click on the file and select Get Info. This window will pop up and you'll be able to tag your photos in that field. I included the word Clarendon or Ozark in my tags just in case something got misfiled. On a PC, here in the light mode windows, right click on the file and select Properties. Go to the Details tab in the Properties window and double click on the Tags field. Type your tag and click Enter and then Apply. Now that you've digitized all your photos and family papers, you can share the digital files with your family. This can be especially helpful if you're trying to figure out who all these people are. There are probably ways to share and comment on photos in iCloud and Dropbox, but the coolest way I found is via Google Photos. You can make an album within the Google Photos app, which you already have if you have a Gmail account and then you share them with your family. Family members can comment on the photos and help you identify people as well as places and events. Your family members can also download photos to have their own copies. Here's a disclaimer. If you remove somebody from a shared album on Google Photos, all comments they added will be removed as well. Also, anyone with access to the album can add others to a shared album. Another way that you can share your digitized photos with family members is to create a private group on Facebook. You can add photos as posts and other family members can comment on the photos. Private groups can be visible or hidden. If you make your group visible, anyone on Facebook can ask to join. If you make it hidden, then you will need to invite people to, to join. Just make sure to get the information off Facebook on a regular basis and attach it to the digital copy so you don't lose it if anything ever happens to Facebook. You can also share your photos in small groups on your personal Facebook page if you want to reach a larger group of people who might be able to give you information about the people and places in your photos. Feel free to email us at memorylab at cows.org about the Memory Lab, about personal archiving or setting up an appointment. Thank you and have a great day, everybody.